Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Welcome back to X Designer Breeds. I am your boy Zion Marley and you saw the thumbnail of this video and also the title. It is going to be an extended video where I will explain to you everything that you will need to know about poodle color coat genetics. Now it can be very daunting sometimes when you're trying to work out the colors that your offspring will produce from your parents and it's not as easy as looking at the uh, at the parents and uh, knowing exactly what the, the offspring will look like, knowing exactly what your puppies will look like. In this video, I'm just going to go through the task of showing you step by step. I will write notes, take notes so that you guys can follow along. You guys can repeat this video as much as you want. Go over it if you haven't uh, grasped the concepts uh, so that you guys can understand fully Poodle color coat genetics. I have a surprise for you at the end of this video, so watch it till the end and I will give you the surprise there and then. If you are a returning member of the channel and you haven't yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Also like this video, share this video to your friends if you have uh, poodle breeders that you know they're wanting to understand uh, poodle color coat genetics. Especially this is for breeders who are producing dogs based on color. You know they are introducing producing different colors in their program, so on and so forth. So if you've embark tested your dog or if you have done some genetic testing on your dog and you have those results back, this is going to be helpful to understand those results. Uh, so stay tuned and get into the video. I will be using my book here and I'm hoping that I don't shift my book because as I have it right now, it is set in the frame of the camera. So if I happen to shift this, I'm gonna have to re-record this all and I don't want that. Okay, so please pray for me that I'm able to focus because I can get a little nerdy and sciencey and I don't want you guys to miss the information that I'll be presenting here, right? So we will start from the very beginning. So we are going to talk about some of the terminologies. I did write down exactly what we'll be covering in this video here. So we'll be going through the terminologies. We're gonna be looking at what a Punnett square is and how to use them. We're gonna be looking at eumelanin and pheomelanin. We're also gonna be looking at the testable loci overview for toy poodles. Uh, they are E, B, K, A, S, and M locus or loci, and there are others, but these are the main ones that we're gonna be covering in today's video. Let us talk about um, some genetic terminologies here. G genetic terms. So the first thing that we're going to define is what's a gene? Uh, because you're gonna need to know what that is to understand the basics of what we're gonna be discussing here. A gene is the basic unit of heredity that is passed from parent to offspring. Uh, genes are made up of DNA, which are found in the chromosomes located in the nucleus of each cell. Uh, so consider this as a cell, right? Uh, this is how I drew them back in college. And this is going to be the nucleus of the cell. Let's just cover that. And within the nucleus, you're going to find chromosomes, which basically looks like uh, an X, right? And these chromosomes are actually made up of genes, which uh, consist of, let's just put these in arrow forms, genes, which actually uh, basically looks like a double helix. Uh, so they are like a double helix going down and between the helix, you will find that they have nucleotides, which there are four of them and they connect with each other just like so. And there are basically protein uh, peptides that connect the G, the DNA molecule together like that. One, from, one copy from each chromosome is passed on to the offspring from each parent. So say for instance, that is the DNA double helix. You will find one here from one uh, parent, parent number one, we'll call that P1, and then the other to complete the helix for parent number two. Uh, so that is what makes up these double uh, helix right here. And this is why each and every individual is an individual, right? This is what defines each and every individual. Within this DNA molecule consists of genetic profiles that uh, is unique for each and e every individual, right? So let us move on. All right, so what is an allele? So we did genes, so what is an allele? 
one of two versions of a gene that is what is called an allele. A dog inherits two alleles from each gene, one from each parent. Say for instance, let us use an example. We're going to go as an example to use the brown gene, which is represented by big B, uh, little b. Uh, each of these will be known as an allele and the unit together is known as the gene, right? So this is just an example. We're just using this, uh, this brown pigment as an example right now because we're, you know, we're just getting started. Um, and we're going to represent this on a Punnett square as well so that you guys can understand what that is. So this unit is called a gene, right? This unit is called a gene that represents two alleles, right? These two alleles. Uh, and each one will come from each parent. So this say, for instance, this is parent one, parent one. And then say, for instance, parent two has maybe a little b, little b. Uh, that's what I refer to them as big B, little b, little b, little b. Uh, so this unit is going to be a gene and then each is going to be an allele right okay so there are homozygous alleles and there are heterozygous alleles uh, from this example homo meaning same and hetero meaning different so this unit here overall right different this is going to be a heterozygous allele and this meaning same little b little b this is going to be a homozygous allele. So that's, if you should hear any of those terminologies uh, in genetics, that's what they refer to. Allele can also be recessive and it can also be dominant. Now, when I refer to little b, big b, that is what I mean. Big b is actually a dominant allele, right? So this big b here from this here, let me see if I can Put that down here. This big B right here is going to be a dominant. And this little one right here is going to be a recessive allele. And if you hear me saying big B, little B um, throughout the course, uh, this, that's what I'm referring to. Big meaning a dominant allele and a little meaning a recessive allele. So that's what I'm referring to when I, when I speak about those two together. Let's look at a locus. A locus is what you will define as the specific location on a gene, of a gene on a chromosome. Uh, the plural form of locus is called loci. So if you hear me saying loci throughout this course, that is what I'm referring to. It's not called locuses. So when we refer to, let, let me just skip back here, to E locus, B locus, K locus, and so forth. That's just the location of that gene on the chromosome. So uh, it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, just, just for definition uh, purposes as to what, if you hear me talking about a locus here in this, in this class. So we covered allele, what's a locus. Now let us go to a genotype and what is a phenotype. Genotype versus phenotype. A genotype is what you will call the combination of alleles or gene that a dog has at a particular locus. So say for instance, using the same example that we had, a big B, little b, or a dominant B, a recessive B, this would be a black a pointed dog. So dogs that have, are referring to poodles, poodles that have black points, right? So this genotype, this genotype carries the phenotype for black points, right? And then you may have little b, little b, which is the recessive allele or recessive gene at this point carries the phenotype for liver points. 
And throughout the course, when we reach the B locus, the B locus is also referred to as the liver locus, and we will discuss that further on in this course, right? So just to give you an example, um, what the genotype is. Genotype is what you will be hearing me talking about the, you know, the the specific gene at a particular locus and the phenotype is the physical appearance affected by the genotype and or it could be affected by the environment as well. So when I say black points or liver points or a red dog or it's the physical appearance of what the dog actually looks like. Uh, if you were able to fully tell the offspring that you will be able to create from looking at the dog then you wouldn't be here, right? Which of course you can definitely tell with a given probability of what the offspring will look like in, in terms of uh, puppies that you'd produce by just looking at the phenotype, which is just the appearance of the dog. But you will need to know the genetic traits itself to actually tell what you will produce in your offsprings, right? So that's what the genotype versus what the phenotype is. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. I'm seeing some notes here. Let's just skip over these notes. I don't know what they are, but all right. So let's get into the nitty gritty now. Colors in dogs are produced by what you call melanocytes. These are cells that actually produce the pigment in dogs. And all dog pigments, not only poodles, but all dog pigments actually are formed from two pigments. And these two pigments, which are created by these mel melanocytes, are eumelanin, right? And then you also have theomelanin. These are the only two pigments that are responsible for coat colors in, in dogs. The absence of pigment is also included, which we will, it's just referred to as white. And say for instance, you may have some dogs with absence of pigment in their, in the points, meaning that the nose, the paw pads and stuff like that, they don't have any pigments and they may have a color, like a pink color. Think, what is that? A pink color. Uh, and these dogs are referred to as albino dogs, right? They, they lack pigment. They don't have any pigment in the nose, uh, the paw pads, the lips, or the eyes. And if, the, if a dog lacks pigment, it's, it's a genetic deformity called albinism. And it is, they're, they're referred to as albinos. We as poodle breeders, we, we know not to breed albinos, right? Because it's a genetic fault within the breed and so we're not going to be breeding them, right? Uh, because albinos, they not only have faults in their DNA, or faults in their genetic in terms of their coat and pigment, but they also have, may carry faults in their um, genetic makeup as well. So that's the reason why we tend not to breed albinos. Two main types of pigments, let me just get back on track here, uh, eumelanin and theomelanin. Now, what are these, you may ask? Eumelanin is actually responsible for brown and black pigment in dogs and also the coats as well. So when I say pigment, I mean the point. Uh, as you guys know, if you guys haven't seen my video on poodle colors explained, I have a video explaining the whole poodle colors in terms of uh, solid colors and also those uh, those markings as well. If you guys haven't seen that, go ahead and check uh, that out because I explain what the pigments are, the two main types of pigments. You have brown or liver pigments and then you also have black pigments. Uh, and these are responsible for the points in or poodles. You also have theomelanin and theomelanin also, and this is pigments on the red spectrum. Okay, I hope you guys are taking notes as I do this as well. This is the third one, which are, we're not gonna really be talking about today. Uh, in this um, course, we're gonna be talking about eumelanin and theomelanin. So let's just recap. Eumelanin, it refers to the black and brown pigments and also the coat color in our poodles or dogs. And also theomelanin, which is the red spectrum uh, pigment in our poodles. And what do I mean by a red spectrum? Red spectrum is what we refer to as all the reds, the apricots, the creams, 
and also whites. Right, so that's that's what we refer to as the red spectrum. Let us go into Punnett squares and what these are. Okay, so what are Punnett squares? Okay, so Punnett squares can be used to assist in predicting the genotypes of puppies, given that the genotype of the parents are known through genetic testing. Uh, if you guys don't know, I test all of my dogs through Embark. And that gives me a full breakdown of the traits that I will be going over in this video. And you know, you can look at these traits and predict the offspring of your puppies uh, based on what the parents are. Uh, so we are going to be using B. The B locus again as an example here for uh, this Punnett square example. And say for instance, we had B, big B, little B as parent one. Okay, let's, let's draw the Punnett square so that you guys get an, an example as to what that is. We're going to be using these two um, variables here. So this is parent one. Let's just represent parent one up top here, right? Okay, I don't like how that looks. But anyways, this is, this is, we're just going through. Parent one is big B, little b, and parent two. is little b, little b. And we're gonna cross these now to see what the offspring we're gonna be producing from these two parents, right? So crossing these, you'll get big b, little b, and you always wanna put the dominant a little first. Uh, that's how it, it usually is represented. Uh, crossing these, well, you will get big b, little b. Crossing these two, you will get little b, little b, and crossing these two, you'll get little b, little b. And as you can see, from the parents here, we will produce, this is 50%, big B, little b, and you'll have 50%, half of them being little b, little b. So 50% of the offspring will have uh, black points and carry four liver points, and 50% of the offspring will have liver points and they only carry four liver points. So if you um, breed this with another, uh, with another parent or with another uh, spouse, <laughs> we should call it, uh, they'll all have, they'll all carry uh, liver points because B here is more dominant in this case because it has two of them, which is uh, shows up in in your in your litter. Uh, so that's what a Punnett square is. Uh, we'll be using Punnett squares as examples throughout this, uh, this course, as you may call it. Or you could use uh, Punnett squares for your own example. And this is what I use if someone should ask me, what should be the outcome? Should I get uh, um, a party litter? Uh, what is going to be my litter? Will, it, will I have phantom litter? You usually basically use a Punnett square cross both parents of what the gene that you want to use um, is. And then you can basically see the breakdown of how the percentage or the probability of what the, of what the offspring will give you, right? This is gonna be the offspring, the, the probability of offspring um, that you'll get from that crossing, right? So that's basically what the Punnett square is. And yeah, I hope this is pretty straightforward because this is the basis of you working out your offsprings from your known uh, genetic information from the parent. Okay, so we did terminologies, we did Punnett square, we did eumelanin versus pheomelanin. And now we are going to be doing going through an overview as to the main locus and what they represent. So we are just going to write these out here. E, B, K, A, S, and M. Uh, we're just gonna be going through the main locus and what they represent. Uh, obviously there are other locus that are not testable, meaning that science has yet far way to go to test for these, um, these traits. The first one that I wanna talk about is the E locus. Uh, the E locus or extension locus is also known as the melanocortin one receptor or MC1R gene. Let me just write that down here, MC1R gene. 
And like I said, we're not going to get too technical as to what these genes are, but this is what they are testing for. No. Let's get into the E locus, right? E locus in, in terms of dominance, we will have E, right? Well, we have EM, but I, I'm not gonna really be talking about EM. It's called the mask uh, and it actually presents itself if the A locus is allowed to show. Now, what I mean by that is some of these loci here, uh, they're conditional. Uh, based on the showing of another locus. So say for instance, A locus is allowed to express itself if the K locus actually shows, and we'll explain that in, in detail more. And K locus is able to express itself if the E locus shows. And I will show a little diagram here on the in this video so that you guys can understand the breakdown or the hierarchy of the dominance in some of these in some of these loci. All right, so EM is more dominant than E, and then the recessive form is actually E. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the different combinations of what you may see when you get back your gen uh, genetic analysis from uh, your the company that you decide to use. So EM is mask, and this is if uh, the A locus is mask is allowed to show. E um, is normal and it contains both eumelanin, you guys remember what that is, black and brown pigment, or melanin, which is the red spectrum, depending on the A locus. So if A locus is not allowed to show, then the coat will contain eumelanin only, which means that it will only have black or brown pigment. And if A locus is allowed to show, that it will contain melanin as well. We will break that down further. So E, can either be like that, or it can either be... So if the A locus is allowed to show, then you will have melanin involved here. And if the A locus is not allowed to show, then you will have um, melanin only. And then you will have small e, small e. Let's break this down further so that we, we get an idea as to what this means. E, big E, big E, the dog does not carry, nor can it produce cream spectrum puppies. And remember what cream spectrum puppies are. They're red, apricots, creams, and white. So more than likely, this is a, a black dog. Right? Okay. So as you can see, we have a dominant E here and a recessive E here. Right, so again, we have big E. Apparently, A locus is allowed to be expressed here. And so this, you will have melanin uh, involved here as well. This dog, depending on what it is bred with, can produce uh, red spectrum puppies. This is typically a black dog, which, okay, let's, uh, let's write these down. Black dog that carries for red red in this case is relative remember that when we say red here in genetics we are referring to red spectrum meaning it can be red apricot cream or it can be white big e big e is a black dog big e little e is a black dog that carries for red and little e little e is recessive this is Fair melanin only. So if you see little e, little e, all of your red toy poodles or all of your red poodles, I'm saying toy poodles because that's what I breed, but I have to remember that there are other poodle breeders here as well. Welcome if you are here. Little e, little e uh, is only fair melanin, which means that it has all the shades of the recessive red, which is red, apricot, cream, and white. So red spectrum dog, so red spectrum. And more than likely, this does. This is not a black dog. It's just red spectrum. And again, remember, when we say red spectrum, we are referring to red, apricot, cream, and white. Things to remember here is that little e, little e covers all other colors and patterns, right? So when we mention patterns, if you guys should take a look back at my other video, we're talking about phantom poodles. We're talking about brindle. We're talking about uh, sable, party. Uh, all of these uh, colors and patterns, little e, little e covers those, um, those spe that spectrum as well. If you don't have any 
your melanin in the dark coat, then you, this is going to cover all of, all of this, right? Because remember that your, your phantom poodle and your brindle and so forth, they have to have black in the coat for it actually to be expressed. This little E, little E will cover everything here. It will cover everything. Even though this is more dominant, this together combined will cover up everything. Also remember that the little e, little e is determined by the intensity gene as well. The intensity gene is referred to as I and depending on the intensity of the, of the gene, then you will have, it could go from a mahogany type of red to all the way to icy white. Okay guys, just a small intermission here. Just to remind you guys to subscribe if you're liking this content so far. Just go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It won't hurt, it's completely free. Smash that thumbs up button as well. Also, I want to let you guys know that I am always free to assist you in predicting your offsprings, the genetic makeup of what your offsprings will look like. So you can comment down below and let me know the genetic profile of the parents that you're planning on breeding so that I can assist you in letting you know what the percentage of the offspring, you know, that they will produce. Since you guys are still here at the middle of the video, let me just go ahead and give you guys a su the surprise that I was teasing you guys about at the beginning of the video. I made an ebook explaining everything in this video, guys. Every single thing in this video is explained in an ebook which is free. It's free. I will leave the link in the description down below where you can download this ebook. That's basically for you guys for supporting my channel and just for sticking with me. And if you haven't yet subscribed, again, I'm reminding you, subscribe because we do stuff like this. We give away free ebooks. But anyways, this is for my uh, poodle breeders. If you guys are interested in reading that book, I explain everything from uh, poodle colors, all the solid colors, all the uh, patterns and markings that poodles have, and even further into explaining uh, poodle color coat genetics as well. So everything in this video is explained in that book and I will link that in the description down below. Let's continue with the video guys. Let's move on to the B locust that we've been using all throughout so far as an example. B locust is also known as the brown locust or the liver locust. Okay, so the gene responsible for the B locust is tyrosine related protein or TYR1 gene. And this involves the production of only black or brown eumelanin. At the B locust, you may have big B, which is referred to as black, or you may have little b, which is referred to as brown. All right now let's look at how these two combinations together, uh, big B is dominant over little b. Let's look at the genotype combinations of, uh, of the, from the B locus. You may have big B, big B, which means that it, the dog is black base with black pigment uh, and the dog can only produce black base puppies. You may have big B, little b, which means that the dog is black base with black pigment, but carries for liver or the brown pigment. And they can produce, depending on what they are bred with, they can produce liver pigmented uh, puppies or offsprings. And then you may have little b, little b, which means that the dog is brown base or liver base and has liver pigment. So remember that when we're, when we're talking about points, we have black points and liver points. So this is what you want to see in your dogs with black points and this is the dogs that have for brown brown or liver pigments or liver points. And remember that all the dogs um all the dogs that should have liver points are uh they're brown, not chocolate, right? Brown there is cafe. Cafe a lot, silver beige. And all the other colors that are not here should have black points, which should be your reds, blacks, whites, silver, all the ones on the red spectrum, apricot, cream, blue. 
Uh, so this is what you want to see in your in your dogs. I would say if you are color breeding uh, your poodles, ensure that you are either correcting those points. Otherwise, don't breed a dog that is red that has brown pigment. Other, you'll just you'll just worse you'll just make it worse, right? Unless you're trying to correct the pigment, try not to breed um, the dog that has a red dog or or any of these dogs that have. Um, brown pigments and vice versa. Okay, let's look at the K locus, which is ooh. Okay, so the gene responsible for the expression of the K locus is known as beta defensin uh, CBD103 gene. Beta defensin gene. This is the locus that you will want to pay attention to, especially if you have uh, markings on your dog or patterned dogs. All right, so the K locus, in terms of dominance, you have the genotypes being KB, KBR, and you will have KY. So that's in terms of in terms of dominance. KBR is not testable, at least for for current state. At the moment, I'm filming this video, so you may not see this in um, your analysis, your genetic analysis. KBR refers to dominant black. KBR is brindle and KY is a non-solid dog, meaning it's a, a pattern dog. It has markings uh, unless it is AA and we'll get into that um, next. Uh, non-solid dog. Let's look at the, the genotypes that are, let me see, I'm moving this book too much. Let's look at the genotypes that are, that can be expressed from the K locus. You may have KB, KB, uh, this is a dominant black dog. It has a solid coat, unless it's Merle, because Merle covers everything. And we'll get into Merle a little later on. I know that some of you guys may be asking me, like, or criticizing me, you know, what are you talking about Merle, Merle and Poodles? Guys, this is just an educational form of video. I'm not di dictating your program or your beliefs. So, you know, just get with it, you know, just pay attention for a little bit. I'm just including everything here uh, so that you, you guys can make an informed decision whenever you guys are taking into consideration genetics in terms of your color breeding program. Uh, so this is more than likely a dominant black dog. It has a solid coat and the dog cannot produce patterned pup puppies. You may have KB, KBR. This is also a dominant black dog that carries for the brindle gene. So the brindle may not be expressed, but it's capable of producing brindle puppies. Uh, let's look at KB, KY. Again, this is a dominant black dog. It has a solid coat. Uh, depending on what the dog is bred with, it is capable of producing solid and patterned puppies. All right, so this is a dominant black dog as well. However, you may find some, because of this allele right here, you may find some that find some dogs where this is kind of seeping through. You may find some lightly colored or lightly patterns on your dogs because of this. So even though it's a dominant black dog, you may find some of these patterns seeping through. And we'll talk about um, why that is as we go on. Um, so we, we also may have KBR, KBR. Obviously, this is a brindled dog, right? You may have KBR, KY. This is also a brindled dog. Have, and then finally, you have, let me see if you guys are seeing me. Okay, you guys are seeing me. You may have KY, KY. And this dog is a patterned dog. This is a pattern dog. And pattern is what we call markings on the body. How you'll know what pattern the dog has or marking the dog has is dependent on the A locus. So remember at the beginning, we were saying that some loci, they basically, they reflect themselves based on the expression of the gene on another loci. This particular one is expressed based on what is at the A locus. And that is what we will be discussing next. So whatever is at the A locus is what, what pattern you're going to be seeing in this dog. And we are moving on to the 
famous a Gucci or a Lucas. Okay, so the agouti or a locus, uh, the gene responsible for this is agouti signaling protein gene, agouti signaling protein or ACIP gene. And in terms of dominance, you are going to have a Y, which is greater than a W, which is greater than a T, which is greater than a. And we'll explain what these are in just a moment. A, in terms of the poodle world, now these may mean different things in terms of different breeds of dogs. I know for sure they mean different things in terms of bully breeding. In terms of poodle breeding, AY is known as a sable dog. And a sable, again, if you guys haven't seen that video, just go ahead and watch it where I explain poodle colors. But sable is where you have a dog that has um, small colored hairs usually they're black on the tips of the uh, of the dog say for instance the the ears or the tail uh, they could be seen on the muzzle sometimes uh, that's what sable is uh, a w is known as the agouti or wild gene agouti and agouti, to be honest, I don't like this color, but agouti is like a multicolored type of dog. It doesn't really know what it wants to be. A T is a dog that has 10 points or a phantom dog, right? And then A is a recessive black dog. It's a non-pattern dog and it is a recessive black. This is the only type of expression you may have as a KYKY with two expressions of A, that is the black dog, that is a solid color dog, right? And this is a, a black non-pattern dog. Non-pattern dog. Now let's get into the genotypes of what is possible at the A locus. Uh, so the first one that we're gonna be talking about is the fully sable dog. This dog is fully sable. It carries two copies of sable. And if it is bred with a KYKY dog, uh, okay, just before I continue, this is assuming that your dog is KYKY. Remember we were saying that for any of the patterns to be expressed on the dog, the dog has to be KYKY. I was saying that you may see some of the patterns being expressed if you have a KBKY because of this KY here, but they're gonna be lightly expressed. Ever so lightly, you may see the patterns coming through. When we but talk this... about the genotypes at the A locus, we are making sure that we have a KY, KY dog. So we were saying that the AY, AY, this is a sable dog. It has two copies of the sable gene. And if it is bred with another KY, KY dog, it will always produce sables. So this is a sable. All right, you may have A, Y, A, W. This is also a sable dog. Obviously, remember we were saying sable is the more dominant of the four here. So if you have this, it's always gonna be a sable, but it carries for a gooty. Carries for a gooty. Carries, it carries it, right? You may also have A, Y, A, T. Also sable, but it carries for phantom. Remember what these mean up here? Okay, it carries for phantom or 10 points, right? Same thing. Uh, you may have an AYA, also a sable dog, and it carries for a recessive black. So that's all the genotypes that could be available for or expressed with an AY dog. Now let's move on to the second one, which is AW. AW is an agouti dog. Like I was saying, agouti is like a multicolored dog. It doesn't really know what it wants to be. And it has two copies of agouti. This is always gonna be an agouti dog. You have AWAT, which is agouti, and it carries for phantom. carries for phantom. You have AWA, which is an agouti dog, and it carries for recessive black.
I'm running out of space here. Let's move on to a T a T. This is one of my favorites. Let me see if you guys can see me all the way up there. You guys can't. Okay. A T a T is one of my favorites. This is phantom or 10 points. And it has two copies of phantom, which means that it will always carry a phantom copy if it's bred with anything. All right. Uh, let's move on to ATA. This is also a phantom dog that carries recessive black. You also have AA, which is the final one. This is a recessive black dog. Okay, so let's move on to things to know when we are considering these genotypes at the A locus. Remember what we said. For the ability of the A locus to show on the coat, it, it, it is determined by the K locus. So you have to look at the K locus first to see um, if any of these patterns are going to be showing on your dog. And the K locus has to be KY, KY for any of those A, for the A locus to be expressed. So we have two more left and then we will conclude this video. I know that it is long, but we have the S locus or the white spotting locus. The gene that is responsible for the S locus is called Micropithalmia Associated Transcription Factor or Micropithalma Transcription Factor Gene. That is the gene responsible at the S locus. Now let, let's look at the, the different alleles that are possible at the S locus. You have a dominant S, which is a solid dog, no white. You have SI, which is Irish, Irish spotting, and this you will, you will not find in any, any poodles, but I will just notate it here just so that you guys can see it. You have SW, you won't find this in any pools as well. This isn't like an extreme white spotting. And then you have SP, which is piebald or abstract as what we call in our poodle or party. So SS is a solid, solid col colored dog that has no white, right? And it cannot produce any party puppies at all, solid white. An SSP dog is a dog with no white markings, no. This is conditional because I have seen a lot of dogs where even though this S is dominant, you may have white spotting in those dogs. And why is that, you may ask? Because of the EE and also it could also be the EE. It could be the eumelanin from the extension locus as to the reason why you may find that spotting, that white spotting in your dog. So the dog has no white markings and it carries for party, but you may find some that has the white spotting on their chest or maybe on their, their, um, their head, their skull, not their skull, but you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. And then you have SP, SP, which is a, an abstract dog or a piebald dog or a party dog. And most likely over 50% of the body is covered in white. No to little white. And this over 50%, so this is maybe like less than 50%. And this is over 50% of the dog is white. Right? So that's, that's what you will see, you know, in only white dogs. So M locus. Now the M locus, like I said, is the Merle locus and it's very, very controversial. And the gene that's responsible for this is known as, as the silver locus protein gene or SILV gene. You may see it um, on your an analysis breakdown. Now, one thing to note here is that the Merle gene only dilutes eumelanin pigment. Um, meaning that it dilutes um, black and also brown. Now, a black-coated dog showing merle pattern is known as a blue merle, right? You guys may already know that. 
And a brown dog having a merle pattern is known as a red merle, or it can also be known as a brown merle. So like I said, the merle gene only affects the eumelanin, it dilutes the eumelanin pigment. Now, as it concerns the poodles, you may have four or three different com combinations. You may have big M. Now, there are different types of alleles that are located at the M locus. We're not going to dive into, there are several, so we're not going to dive into any of them. We're just going to be talking about the genotypes here in this breakdown. And the MM genotype, which is more dominant over any of them, is a dog that has two copies of Merle, which is known as the double Merle. And these dogs will have hearing or vision deficiencies. Further testing would be necessary to um, determine the length of these alleys before you breed. You actually don't want to breed for a double Merle because, like I said, it has so many health complications. And this is why, or one main reason, why the Merle gene is said to not um, naturally occurring in toy poodles or in, t in poodles in general because uh, of, of this you know, whole thing. It's, it's something that's new, it's something that's trendy, it's something that's upriced as well, meaning that it's very, very expensive, um, mainly because it's expensive to produce. And if you are a breeder that a toy poodle breeder that breeds from merles, ensure that you are doing it in the correct way. Ensure that you are genetically testing your dogs and you are using your Punnett squares and you are putting those um, together and you need to even further test to see what type of alleles on the M locus they are carrying because you don't want to produce a double merle dog which has all the genetic issues that you can think of, hearing issues, vision issues, all of these issues. Um, you have a double M, small M, which is basically most of the Merles that you will see. Um, this is a dog that has a copy of Merle and the Merle gene is, a, is always dominant. Once you have a, a M, a big M, it's always dominant. So it will show it will show phenotypically in your dogs. Uh, further testing is also needed to produce these types of merles. Like I said, if you are on the market, in the market looking for a merle dog, ensure that you are asking for the genetic analysis for the parent dogs so that you're not buying a puppy that is compromised or that is not bred well. And Look at this, you don't want to see a double Merle puppy or you don't want to purchase a double Merle puppy at all. And so this is what you want to purchase whenever time you are purchasing a Merle dog. And then you may have a small M, small M, and this means that the dog is non-Merle. It does not contain Merle or the Merle gene whatsoever. Ever. Thank you guys for watching. If you are still here with me, I know that was an extended video, uh, but it's a video that I've spent the time on just to ensure that you guys are knowledgeable. You, you guys are, you know, you guys know what you guys are doing whenever you guys are putting two poodles together to try and produce a certain color. So Thank you guys if you're still here with me to sticking at the end of the video. And like I said, I have linked in the description below the PDF version for the ebook that I, I spent my time writing. So you guys can just go ahead and download that. It's completely free. There, there's no commitment. The only thing that I want from you guys is to just subscribe to this video, to the channel, uh, like this video, and also share it to your, your uh, poodle breeder friends as well. Uh, so thank you guys for sticking here with me. I will see you guys in the next video.